Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest upon her is Dr. Ravi Teja Rudraju from Sydney, Australia. Dr. Rudraju is an orthopedic surgeon who completed his residency training in Hyderabad and has been practicing as a hip and knee specialist. He worked as visiting fellow in sports medicine and adult reconstruction at the Cleveland Clinic in Florida for a year and later did his clinical fellowship at the adult reconstruction for Geisinger Clinic in Pennsylvania, United States. He then completed an Australian Orthopedic Association clinical fellowship in robotic joint replacement at Melbourne and a revision arthroplasty fellowship in South Korea before moving back to Sydney at the Sydney Orthopedic Research Institute. His research interests are in preoperative planning, robotic and computer navigation surgery, and also periprosthetic joint infections. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Ravi Teja Raju for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Ravi. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, firstly, a uh, big thank you to Dr. Gopalan for uh, in inviting me to this uh, presentation and then it's always an honor to uh, present here because uh, I remember going through his textbooks while uh, going through my postgraduate training and uh, uh, today presenting in front of him on his platform is like a great honor for me. And um, so right now I'm a knee fellow in uh, Royal North Shore Hospital uh, and I work for Sydney Orthopedic Research Institute. Uh, so we do all knee surgeries, sports, complex trauma, knee orthoplasty. Um, it's an amazing place uh, to learn all the new uh, clinical work and also the research uh, that they do is quite exciting. So looking forward for this year to have a productive outcome in terms of research as well as uh, latest advances in knee surgery. Coming to the disclosures, I have nothing to disclose uh, on this topic. And uh, before starting formally into the scientific discussion on uh, robotic knee replacements, uh, I just wanted to share my fellowship journey. So after passing out in 2017, I got an opportunity to go to South Korea to do a hip and knee fellowship. And that's the first time I got introduced to computer navigation. It was uh, quite uh, a difficult transition to understand uh, from manual TK to how uh, computer navigation TK works. Uh, it took a while to understand how the planning works, uh, all other uh, steps in the surgery. But uh, by the end of my fellowship, I got an idea of uh, how the computer navigation uh, surgery does in terms of uh, joint replacement. Uh, later, I went to US in Cleveland Clinic. Uh, there I got an opportunity to uh, learn more about preoperative planning. Uh, so uh, I, I could parallelly see two different kind of uh, technology advancements. One, the computer navigation. The other one is uh, preoperative planning. And then when later I moved to uh, Geisinger Clinic in Pennsylvania, I was first introduced to Mako Robot, wherein uh, I could see both preoperative planning as well as computer navigation fused to give a product wherein you have a robotic tool to execute the plans that you made before and to have the accurate implants placement. From there, uh, we did some research studies on cost analysis and other ones on Mako. And uh, during that one year, I got to learn a lot about robotic knee replacements. And uh, later which I came down to Australia and started my fellowship in Melbourne in this year, early this year in January, where uh, we got an opportunity to uh, expose to four different uh, robotic systems, starting with Mako, then Omnibot, then Navio, and then Rosa. So uh, having seen all these latest technological advancements, uh, I could uh, definitely see a great potential for uh, robotic joint replacements in the coming years to come as it has a lot of advantages to offer. And uh, looking at the uh, knee replacement market as such, uh, it's uh, been growing exponentially. And uh, you can see here that it's uh, expected to have $12.72 billion in 2026. So this interesting article that came in uh, New York Times uh, recently uh, shows how uh, the 
total joint replacements have gone up and along with that robotic joint replacements are also uh, gaining up momentum uh, in the field of uh, joint replacements. So if you see in early, late 50s, 60s and 70s, most of the patients uh, uh, who were born called the baby boomers are now in an age group of around 70 to 80 years. And uh, contrary to the previous uh, uh, philosophy, like in the end of old age, uh, you just need to, uh, you know, just you need to be pain free from the joint problems or uh, just have a sedentary lifestyle. But now in the present scenario, more people want to get back to their active lifestyle, get back to sport, uh, want to have their uh, terminal life or uh, the last, last phases of their life want to be more active. With that, uh, there's a lot of uh, importance that has grown up uh, for the success of these uh, total joint replacement surgeries. And uh, these robots have uh, uh, increased the ability to more precisely place the implant and more accurately place the implant. Uh, and these offer a great benefit for patients in the years to come. So in the last uh, decade, you can see there's also a exponential raise in the use of robots in the surgical specialty compared to other specialties. And also similarly, if you see from the last decade, there's also a study growth in uh, use of surgical robots. Uh, in the year 2020, if you see in here, most of the major volume of the robotic systems are used in the surgical field. And uh, we all know this magic figure of 20% patients remain dis dissatisfied after total knee joint replacements. And uh, it turns out to be one in five are not satisfied. So this led to uh, surgeons as well as the industry look for uh, different kind of solutions to uh, resolve this problem. And one such solution could be robotic joint replacements. And uh, before understanding how it can solve that 20% problem, if not 20%, at least some percentage of dissatisfaction. Before that, we need to understand the different uh, alignment strategies that have uh, of late gaining a lot of attention. All We all know that mechanical alignment is a gold standard alignment and it's been followed since last 20, 25 years. But the recent uh, alignment strategy called the kinematic alignment, uh, described best you can all. So it's basically trying to restore the patient knee anatomy. So, but it has its own uh, questions and doubts because uh, a natural knee anatomy of uh, more than five degrees of varus in tibia would lead to implant loosening and failure. And those were the skepticism uh, behind many people not adopting this uh, kinematic alignment as uh, the regular standard way of practice. And the new philosophies that have come up recently are the inverse and the restricted kinematic alignment, which are a kind of extension of kinematic alignment. In inverse kinematic alignment, you try to resurface the tibia with equal cuts and then try to adjust the femoral component to balance the knee joint. In restricted kinematic alignment, we try to have restricted boundaries and perform the kinematic alignment. And the one that we have is the functional alignment wherein we adjust the position of the components accordingly to balance the knee. So other than mechanical alignment, the other alignments which I just mentioned, starting from the kinematic, inverse kinematic or restricted kinematic and also the functional alignment, all the, these alignment strategies are discussed uh, in terms of like one or two degree differences. So in order to achieve that kind of uh, small, small differences in terms of uh, alignments, a human or a, a surgeon manually doing it is quite difficult uh, to achieve whatever he wanted to achieve. So robotics is thought to be a potential solution uh, in executing the alignment philosophy in future. And also, also, it's very important uh, for uh, the people to understand this latest paper that came out recently from uh, McDacy and their group. Uh, so, so they have classified the knees into nine types, nine phenotypes. So, so 
any knee that is uh, called the native knee, which, is, which can be of nine different types. And it's very important to understand which type of knee uh, before we venture into a joint replacement for the knee. So if you see in this study, they have superimposed uh, a normal knee anatomy over the arthritic anatomy. And they found that the type one and the type two knees in uh, both the classifications have are the most common type of uh, common types of uh, knee phenotypes. So, if a person who has a kind of uh, phenotype of type five, which has got neutral alignment with horizontal joint line, and then you try to restore the knee with a type one knee, wherein you uh, restore the knee anatomy being oblique joint line with a apex distal joint line, of course, the patient is not going to be happy. So in order to make the patient happy, we should try to give a knee wherein he has this kind of knee for quite a long time. So there's a lot of uh, traction that's gaining momentum on this uh, classification and understanding the importance of it before executing uh, the patient's uh, uh, joint procedure. So Having said that, uh, let's look back and see what are the limitations with conventional jig-based uh, total knee replacements. So with the conventional uh, jig-based total knee replacements, uh, patients need preoperative x-rays, uh, and also it's important to have intraoperative landmarks. And these uh, um, alignment jigs have to be manually positioned to cut the bone resection and implant position. Therefore, uh, it's always uh, seen that surgeons might uh, achieve or might not achieve all the times of what they want to um, achieve in terms of alignment and they're poorly reproducible and it's not very accurate uh, in terms of implant position. It all depends on the surgeon's skill as well and more, a more high volume, well experienced surgeon uh, can definitely reproduce uh, the alignment of whatever he wanted to but a young beginner or an young orthoplasty surgeon would not have that kind of accuracy in his early career. Some more limitations were uh, for the ligament tensioning, it's always subject to intraoperative assessments. And we cannot fine tune it by making bone resections to balance it, rather we go for uh, soft tissue releases, which would further hamper the uh, knee anatomy. Also, it uh, doesn't protect the periarticular soft tissue envelope. Uh, so it should be really careful when using a manual saw while doing this uh, manual conventional uh, total knee replacement. And there's no real-time feedback on the thickness of uh, or the orientation of the bone cuts. Also, intramedullary referencing guides are thought to increase the risk of thromboembolic events while doing the procedure. And what are the benefits that robotic knee can offer in terms of uh, comparing to the manual TKA? Robotic TK is more accurate and we can do the pre-surgical planning as discussed as mentioned before that if you want to achieve a kinematic alignment, we can pre-operatively plan and execute the plan accurately. It also offers high pre precision and also can execute the plan uh, that we have planned before uh, even before performing the surgery. And it gives more natural surgical results. It helps patients to recover faster and also it enables us to compare the object to intraoperative data uh, with collecting the validated patient reported outcomes, wherein you can correlate between the patient reported outcomes and the intraoperative data to predict uh, future modeling, wherein you can choose a plan based on previous uh, thousand or one lakh uh, patient knee surgeries, wherein that patients had the best outcomes. So if you see this uh, flow chart, wherein we can see where we stand at the moment. So we have this mechanical alignment, sorry. We have this mechanical alignment as gold standard approach. And then we have newer alignment approaches, wherein uh, you have uh, kinematic alignment, restrictive inverse kinematic alignment, adjusted mechanical alignment, the functional alignment. So all these newer alignment strategies. And now you have uh, the recent papers that talk about the different knee phenotypes 
which offers us a best, better understanding of the pre-arthritic knee anatomy. And then having all this information in hand and having a plan to execute whatever we want to do in terms of achieving the patient's knee anatomy. We have a tool called Robot Now, wherein it, it will exactly and accurately executes the plan and will offer, offer a personalized medicine by giving the personalized knee for the patient by which he was living from the last few decades. So that will offer the patient a great benefit in terms of uh, faster recovery and also low pain scores. So if you compare computer navigation versus robotic TKA, in the computer navigation, you have live on-screen information with anatomy of the knee kinematics. And also you have the CT scan uh, that can be utilized to create a 3D data or else you can interoperatively map and also create a generic model of the knee joint uh, wherein you can also create a kind of a 3D model, but it all depends on the surgeon's uh, um, identification of the right landmarks in the body. So this patient specific anatomical data with uh, recommendations can offer us to choose the right bone resection and uh, optimal implant positioning. But the computer system does not actively control or restrain the motor function of the operating surgeon. Whereas in robotic TK, so the software which will convert this uh, 3D model uh, into a virtual kind of an image wherein this patient's anatomy is represented in a 3D uh, reconstruction image where you can place the implants onto the image and then can calculate the optimal bone resection and also look at the implant position. So this robotic device helps to execute the preoperative patient specific plan with a high level of accuracy as well as depending on the degree of control it is uh, either classified as active, semi-active or passive systems, which we will be in detail discussing in the further slides. So looking at the advantages that uh, patient-specific instrumentations have versus uh, computer navigation. So patient-specific instrumentation has uh, advantages uh, by reducing the outliers, also position the implants more reliably, and also there are uh, no midterm and the long-term clinical function outcomes or survivorship that show that are they're more superior than uh, conventional TK. So although it has uh, got good attention in the last decade, but slowly having robotics in place would slowly uh, maybe fade out the patient-specific instrumentation and uh, more uh, people will incline towards the robotic technologies be because uh, robotic technologies would offer more accuracy and uh, better positioning of the implants. This is a gross uh, overview of uh, the available robotic solutions that we have at the moment. Uh, so starting from the T solution, uh, also Rosa, then we have Mako, also we have Navio, and then uh, we have Cori and then Omnibot. From Depusynthes, uh, we have got a recent uh, robot called Valis, which was approved this year. So depending on the different robotic system, and then we call uh, open or closed. Open systems being, uh, they can be utilized with any implant or any company uh, implant. But with the closed system, it's always uh, the robotic solution which offers the uh, bony cuts will always be replaced by their company implant of uh, whatever their uh, uh, implants are. They usually are, they're bound to their company implants. And most of the robotic systems at the, in the market are closed, uh, closed platforms rather than open platforms. And uh, in, in case of type, it is active, semi-active and passive. So active, it does everything by itself. Surgeon will not intervene and uh, robot will uh, accurately deliver the plans of whatever we have planned before. With semi-active, so the pre-operative plan should be approved by the surgeon, but still the control will be within the surgeon. So surgeon does the job, but uh, robot will help uh, you know, in by giving a kind of a haptic feedback and tactile stimulus in order to 
further uh, do the cuts. With passive ones, um, there will not be any kind of a haptic feedback to the surgeon, but it uh, offers a uh, kind of a robotic platform wherein you can uh, do it, you can do the cuts by uh, hand uh, handling your manual saw. So all these ones are uh, very latest ones and they have approved in the last few years. And um, some utilize uh, pre-operative CT scan to build a 3D model and some uh, just use the intraoperative registration to create a 3D model. But there are uh, ups and downsides of both the solutions for it. So if you see what are the upsides and the downsides for uh, image-based versus image-less solutions. So for uh, image-based solutions, pre-operative imaging is uh, important. Usually we take uh, people, uh, patients need uh, to undergo a CT scan. It further increases the cost and radiation exposure to the patients. Also, it has a high radiation dose, which might increase the risk of malignancy. Whereas in case of imageless uh, platforms, although it reduces the surgical time and the radiation exposure, it is more reliant on uh, surgeon's accuracy during the bony landmark registration. Also patients with notable deformity or bone loss may have altered anatomical landmarks. And uh, if surgeon by mistake registers the long uh, bony landmarks, then it creates a wrong plan, wherein uh, the result will be completely uh, grossly mistaken for uh, wrong registrations. So therefore it's very important to uh, give the right landmarks while uh, registering the bony landmarks in case of image-less platforms. So as discussed before, closed versus open platforms. Uh, closed platforms are always uh, compatible with manufacturer and uh, specific implant designs with their own companies. Uh, but uh, this is, has a disadvantage of uh, being, uh, it cannot, surgeons do not want to change their implant practices wherein they have been with some company for the last few years. And now because this robotic platform doesn't offer that, surgeons might not like it uh, in, in a particular way. And um, in coming to the open platforms, although uh, you can use uh, different implants for this open platforms, but these platforms do not have detailed biomechanical uh, kinematic data, which is not so accurate if you compare it to a closed system. So starting with the ro active robotic systems, uh, so they perform the designated task completely independent of the surgeon. So, but the surgeon calculates the optimal bony resection and the final implant placement, and also the alignment on the robotic computer software. But the intraoperative robot executes the preoperative plan with high level of precision and accuracy. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. And uh, coming to the semi-active robotic systems. So semi-active robotic systems give uh, a tactile feedback with uh, procedural safeguards. Also have uh, haptic feedback in terms of auditory, tactile, and visual clues. So it does not routinely recognize the aberrant soft tissue interposition. And also uh, it's important even with semi-active robotic solutions to pair, uh, carefully place the retractor in order to avoid the ligamentous injuries. Sorry about that. And uh, coming to the comparison between uh, semi-active robotic solutions, we have uh, Mako versus Rosa. Mako is produced by Stryker and uh, Rosa from Zima Biomet. Uh, so for Mako, it can perform total knee replacement, uh, then unicondylar knee replacement, and also it can perform total hip procedures. But with Rosa, it can, at the moment, it is approved for total knee replacement. Uh, I think this year they have got approval for the uni knee replacement as well. So with Mako, they have got this uh, saw blade, which has uh, got a haptic feedback. 
but in rosa it's a cutting guide that comes in the surgical field and the surgeon has to still cut the bone by a manual saw uh, by himself so usually striker mako is attached to triathlon implant and uh, rosa is attached to next gen and uh, persona implant so looking at the passive systems wherein uh, the passive robotic tk assist in surgical procedures under complete continuous and uh, direct surgeon control so it's similar uh, to other two systems but uh, it doesn't have a kind of a haptic feedback or uh, uh, tactile stimulus uh, for a surgeon to perform the surgery so how does the workflow work so initially the surgeon will preoperatively plan by placing the implants on the patient's knee anatomy and then uh, once the robot is registered and uh, later pay, when performing the surgery after doing the arthrotomy surgeon would uh, register the bony landmarks and also the landmarks all around the femur and the tibia in order to provide the accuracy uh, between the preoperative planning and intraoperative registration so once we have the plans surgeon would do the ligament balancing at 0 degrees and 90 degrees to see what are the tensioning of the soft tissues and once we have this tensioning then surgeon would choose a philosophy of whatever he want to do either mechanical or kinematic or any of the new, newer alignment strategies once he chooses that he would accordingly adjust the implants to balance the knee once he does the balancing then the robot will come into the surgical field uh, to execute the plan so once the plan is executed then uh, it is replaced by the uh, original implants and uh, the trackers are off uh, after all the uh, balancing and all the range of motion uh, data is taken this is a small uh, demonstration of uh, how the maker works you have the potential to more accurately place implant components compared to plan with the help of mako robotic arm assisted surgery introducing mako total knee a key milestone in orthopedic surgery the mako total knee application features our clinically proven triathlon total knee system mako total knee expands our current mako offering to provide a comprehensive solution with proprietary robotic arm assisted joint replacement technology the combination of the mako partial knee and total knee applications allows you to offer robotic arm assisted procedure for your patients for both partial and total knee indications mako now addresses the knee continuum of care and enables you to select the appropriate robotic arm assisted knee solution for each patient the mako total knee application was built upon the foundation of clinical success with mako partial knee which has been shown to be 2 to 3 times more accurate and 3 times more reproducible than manual techniques which resulted in less pain in the 90 day post operative period and 92% patient satisfaction at 2 years mako is designed to achieve functional implant positioning which is patient specific implant placement as a result of enhanced planning dynamic joint balancing and robotic arm assisted bone preparation These three core features were adapted to enable a Mako total knee procedure with triathlon, enhanced planning, CT data segmented to create a 3D model of the patient's bony anatomy. The Mako total knee application allows you to position the triathlon implant on your patient's virtual anatomy prior to the procedure. This patient-specific preoperative plan enables more accurate implant positioning to plan. During surgery, bone registration and verification are designed to align the 3D model with your patient's knee. Dynamic joint balancing, Mako provides you flexibility to modify the pre-op plan. After completing a kinematic assessment of the joint, you can perform intraoperative adjustments to optimize implant placement. Robotic arm-assisted bone prep. The Mako total knee application does not require alignment instruments or cutting guides. Similar to Mako partial knee, virtual boundaries assist the surgeon in executing bone resections to the final plan. These virtual boundaries have the potential to protect essential anatomical structures of the knee during bone preparation, including the PCL and the popliteal artery. Once bone preparation is complete, you'll place the components using triathlon instrumentation. In a cadaveric study on average, 
make Hotobu Ni final bone cuts and final component positions were five and three times more precise to plan compared to the manual TKA control, respectively. The changing healthcare environment is creating uncertainty for many. Mako robotic arm assisted surgeons. Yeah, so that's how it goes with Mako. So first, as mentioned, first the pre-op planning, then we um, then register the bony landmarks and then Mako will execute the plan um, before uh, and after the joint balancing to give the accurate results. And this is uh, a small demonstration on the Navio robotic solution. The Navio surgical system has a small footprint that seamlessly integrates into OR workflows. Instead of a preoperative CT scan, mapping of the bone surface is done interoperatively and is used to create a 3D representation of the bone structure. Advanced planning software allows the surgeon to virtually position the implant and balance soft tissues throughout the full range of motion prior to bone resurfacing. Robotic assistance is delivered through a handheld tool. Computer navigation tracks the position of the robotics assisted handpiece relative to the bone surface. The surgeon accurately removes the damaged bone surface using robotics assistance, making room for the implant. The final step confirms the implant is placed accurately, as intended, based on the surgical plan. Okay, so if you see the major difference between the Mako and the Navio here, Mako has a haptic uh, arm with a saw attached to it. But whereas in Navio, there's a burr that comes in, in place of uh, a haptic arm, but the burr moves up and down according to the plan wherein it cuts wherever it is required. And if it's cutting more than required, it just goes off and uh, just uh, avoids being cutting the unrequired parts of the bone. So with regards to the execution, it's almost the same, but uh, also the major difference with Navio and Mako, Mako would be, Mako needs a preoperative CT scan, but whereas uh, Navio doesn't need a CT scan, wherein it uses a computer navigation technology, wherein we register intraoperatively and uh, thereby planning the case uh, intraoperatively itself to execute the plan. And then we have another uh, robotic solution, Rosa from Zima Biomet.
Yeah, so that's with the Rosa. So if you see the difference between uh, the other two ones with the Rosa is that it has got a four in one uh, cutting block instead of a haptic arm or a burr. So once we have the pre-operative plan, then we, uh, in order to execute the plan, this four in one cutting block will come into the surgical field and the surgeon would manually put that uh, four in one cutting block onto the femur or the tibia and then uh, fix it with uh, the pins. Once the pins are fixed, then we cut it with the manual saw. And then we have the next robotic solution called the Omnibot. Uh, I'll play the small description. This is a, a kind of different kind of a robotic solution compared to the other three that we just saw. Uh, it's uh, a solution wherein we have an omni bot which has a balance bot along with a robot balance bot uh, is a, a device wherein we try to measure the joint balance before surgery or the before doing the cuts in order to see how balanced the joint is first and then accordingly we plan the cuts in order to have an equal uh, flexion and extension gaps in the knee joint Based on the surgeon's plan, the robotic guide automatically rotates to the proper angle for the first cut. A handheld surgical saw is inserted into the guide and the first cut made. The robotic guide automatically advances through the remaining four cuts, precisely aligning the guide each time to the correct angle and location. The surgeon has complete control of every cut and can even make small adjustments to ensure the results match the surgical plan. The surgeon next reshapes the tibia. The omnibotic system confirms the cutting guide is exactly positioned as indicated by the surgeon's plan, so the surgeon can make a single precise cut. Okay, that's a short demonstration of the omnibot. Based on, and then uh, we've got one more presentation on how this omnibot works. Assisted total knee system allows you to plan and execute total knee replacement procedures based on the requirements of your patient's anatomy. You can document kinematic results for every patient. So, first, uh, when we uh, do the flexion and extension, here we in the screen we can see uh, the alignment of the knee, whether it's varus or valgus, and then it generates a kind of a graph on either side showing us the balance of the knee whether it's tight or uh, lax on medial side and the lateral side. That is done with the balance bot. And then later, once we balance uh, the knee, later the cuts are made with the robotic device that we just saw in the previous uh, demonstration. Perform detailed mapping of the knee with Omni's patented bone morphing technology. And execute your plan with a high level of precision, accuracy, and reproducibility. The Omni system has been designed to accommodate a near limitless combination of surgical techniques. Whether you prefer to cut the femur or tibia first, follow a measured resection philosophy, and or maintain ligament balance, the system gives you the freedom to customize your profiles for every case. Your workflow can also be adapted intraoperatively. In this short demonstration, we'll showcase a robotically assisted femur first approach. You'll see how this small portable workstation allows you to design a plan, virtually performing the surgery on screen before making any cuts. Then execute the plan to achieve unprecedented accuracy and surgical results. Because all surgical planning is done in real time and based on the patient's actual measured anatomical data, there are no preoperative scans required and no need for custom made cutting blocks. Now, let's head to the OR. Small and portable, the Omni Robotic Workstation can be easily positioned in a crowded OR with its overhead camera typically located within five to eight feet of the operative knee. 
arrays facing the camera are mounted medially on the patient's femur and tibia. Setup for the robotic cutting guide begins by mounting the femoral arrays with two screws inserted into the medial femoral condyle using the pin placement guide. The tibia array is then attached with two screws inserted through the skin. The arrays are placed on screw fixations and calibrated to sync with the camera. This attachment creates a secure and stable fixation platform for the robotic cutting gun. The next step is to identify critical anatomical landmarks. Simply follow on-screen prompts and touch the P pointer to each landmark. So how does the system optimize implant fit? It includes patented bone morphing technology which allows you to quickly create a detailed, accurate 3D digital model of the knee. Bone morphing is intuitive to you. Simply run the pointer Sorry. across the femoral surface as shown. The system allows you to rapidly acquire data points, and it alerts you if more points are needed. You can also perform light bone morphing of the tibia. The system acquires just enough data points to provide sufficient visualization of the tibia. And it generates real-time patient-specific data that can be used to determine resection, implant placement, and to make decisions about soft tissue balancing. We all know success in total knee arthroplasty is critically dependent upon implant alignment. As shown in this preoperative assessment, a quantitative analysis of the knee kinematics displays potential range of motion and varus valgus stability. Now let's take a look at how this robotic assisted system supports femoral planning. The system is designed to accommodate the apex knee with all sizes and models pre-programmed into the software. Based on these configurations and your preferences, the system calculates implant sizing and alignment, which you can fine tune. This enables you to plan and visualize those planned bone resections before cuts are made. This digital plan is used to determine the position of the cutting guide. First, the robotic cutting guide is placed into the femoral fixation base and fixed into proper alignment. After the system performs a calibration, the cutting guide is positioned to make the first distal cut. The surgeon is always in full control and can make any final adjustments necessary before performing the bone resection. As you carry out bone resections, the system also senses if there is too much pressure on the guide and will resist against inaccuracy while notifying you with an audible tone. After each resection has been completed, cuts are validated using the G pointer. If necessary, small adjustments as little as one millimeter in thickness can be made. After confirming the distal cut, the cutting guide automatically advances to the next cutting position. The following resections are carried out with equal precision. Again, every cut can be validated to ensure accuracy. The robotic cutting guide integrated with the system replaces the need to manually position and pin conventional cutting jigs, which can introduce errors in alignment and implant fit. Because the system automates placement of each cut according to your plan, you can feel confident knowing you'll achieve the most accurate results for all femoral resections. Next, we'll show you how easily you can reshape the tibia. First, attach the adjustable cutting guide into position using the three pins as shown. Then position the block by turning the three color-coded knobs. System prompts specify the direction and precise amount of rotation for each knob. The system displays a green line to indicate the guide is properly aligned.
Once the guide is positioned, you can perform the tibia resection. Then verify the cut with the G reference guide. A green line on screen indicates the cut was executed per your plan. Yeah, so that's how uh, the cuts are made once we have the pre-operative plan. Uh, uh, and then that's how we execute the plan later on. So here it's just to show that, uh, sorry. Here it's just to show that uh, the balance bot, wherein on the left, you can see um, the balance bot that goes into the joint first and it measures the uh, flexion and the extension space and see whether the joint is balanced or not. Accordingly, then we make the cuts and then again, we trial the implants to see in the final whether this uh, knee joint is well balanced and the alignment is corrected. And this is the, the robotic solution from uh, Johnson & Johnson, that's uh, Velis, that was approved this year. Uh, so it's thought that uh, this system occupies less footprint in the theater because uh, this uh, robotic solution is attached to the operating table and the console is uh, very quite smaller in space compared to Mako and Rosa. This is a QS from Mirror. Uh, this is an active robot wherein it executes all the plan by itself. Uh, and it is uh, approved very recently uh, in uh, US. In the surgical setup, uh, you can see the robot uh, on the right side. Uh, surgeon stands on the right side uh, next to the robot and the operating console will be on the opposite side wherein you have the screen as well as trackers. So once we make the preoperative plan, surgeon would uh, execute the plan looking at the screen. And in case of Mako, you can see the haptic arm cutting the bone. Uh, if it is going outside the plan, then immediately the saw shuts off uh, or uh, immediately it gives you a warning that uh, you are not executing the plan. This is a short demonstration of uh, short demonstration of uh, a I'm robotic uh, case planning. St. John's, and we wanted to put together a slideshow of how we correct common deformities using the robotic knee system. Um, so, as we can see on this radiograph, this is a very typical deformity. Several things are going on. It's deformity in multiple planes. So, so there's a flexion contracture. There is something called varus or malangulation, and then there's also translation of the tibia off to the side. Okay. So the importance of the robotic system is that there's an a robotic assist, but there's also a balancing system built into the computer hardware. And when we look at this, we can see uh, quantitatively and not just qualitatively the extent of the deformity. So rather than just saying the knee doesn't straighten, we have actual quantitative information about the degree of contracture. In this particular knee, it's a 13 degree flexion contracture. We can also measure the amount of varus. This is eight degrees of varus. So rather than just saying the leg is crooked, we know that there's a very specific amount in degrees. We can look at the amount of asymmetry in extension. This is 15 on the medial side, 20 millimeters on the lateral side. So it tells us this is a five millimeter asymmetry. And we can also see the subluxation. Sorry, for some reason, this uh, video is not going through. Just wanted to try and show you how it, uh, how you can plan the case. I'll walk you through rather than uh, probably going through. Of the robotic so here you can see once we have the preoperative plan, then we can see the uh, flexion and extension gap spaces here, which is uh, in the preoperative plan here. So once we have this, then we tension the knee in both 90 degrees as well as uh, in extension, and then see what's the correctable uh, space that we can get after uh, doing the varus stress and the valgus stress on the knee. Once we have that uh, uh, values, then uh, later we will be planning the implants 
accordingly, wherein you first fix the tibia. If you are following a mechanical alignment, you would cut uh, perpendicular to the uh, anatomical axis of the tibia. And then we rotate the component accordingly for the femur to add the flexion space. If you want to add more of uh, uh, the space on the medial side, you would externally rotate the femur in order to uh, increase the flexion space on the medial side. In the extension, similarly, if you want to add more space on the extension, you try to either uh, make it into uh, varus on the tibia and the femoral side, wherein the implant will be tilted onto the medial side, wherein it increases the extension space here. And similarly, uh, in order to balance the knee, you can also add increase the tibial slope as well as uh, improve the flexion of the femoral component. So once we have this, we try to balance the knee. Once the knee is balanced, then uh, we have the saw that comes in to the surgical field wherein it executes the plan. And then after the, once the cuts are made, then we again trail with the implants to see whether uh, the balance is equal or not. In once you trial the implants, then you see, uh, once you see, once you balance the knee, then you see the implants having a place, then you see the balancing of 20, 20 uh, of space on equal side, which uh, shows that the components are in the right position. And then uh, that helps us to have the balanced knee uh, after the surgery. So looking at some of the studies um, for the learning curve, if you see robotic TKA, which uh, definitely has increased uh, operative times and also it has uh, the increased the level of anxiety for the surgeons for the initial few cases. But uh, later on uh, in the learning curve, it, doesn't, it didn't take much time for the surgeons to achieve a proper implant positioning. So initially surgeons might feel a bit of uh, difficulty to adopt to this new, new technologies, but uh, once they are accustomed to kind of a workflow, then it makes things much easier for them. And then uh, looking at the study done by uh, Zachary, uh, they have looked into the 40 robotic TKA versus uh, traditional TKA. So they have seen that the learning curve for robotic TKA appeared to progress very rapidly. And sometimes they have also noticed that adapting to these no new technologies can be associated with difficulty, but uh, uh, they have seen that it is only for the first few cases, but the later uh, part of the learning curve is not as difficult as in the first few cases. Looking at the uh, technical skill, it is uh, definitely uh, in this paper, they have looked into the surgical times. Uh, Using a robot would definitely increase the surgical time in the learning phase. But once things settle in and then uh, surgeons are accustomed to the new workflow, it is almost similar to a traditional TK. Looking at the soft tissue protection, uh, there was significantly less damage occurred uh, to posterior, posterior cruciate ligament in the robotic TK versus a manual TK. Also, in terms of uh, injury to the deep collateral ligaments, uh, compared to a manual TKA, robotic TKA has got uh, less incidence of uh, injuries to the collateral ligaments. Also in this study from uh, Kayani and their group have looked into the soft tissue trauma using uh, uh, in the robotic TKA versus uh, conventional TKA. They've seen that uh, in robotic TK, there's uh, less medial soft tissue injury compared to uh, manual TK. And uh, they've seen that the implants are positioned more accurately and the bone cuts were more accurate in robotic TK. And requiring the manipulation under anesthesia compared to uh, conventional TK, definitely robotic TK has got a uh, low rate of uh, patients who have undergone uh, manipulation under anesthesia. Looking at the patient reported outcomes, uh, in the initial six weeks to three months uh, in the study done by Anton and their group have seen that uh, robotic TK have got uh, higher patient reported outcomes and uh, patients have uh, large improvements in walking, standing and uh, satisfaction in terms of uh, patients undergoing uh, robotic TK. 
there are other uh, few studies uh, showing the similar results in the early uh, post operative period and within one year uh, and also a study from the same group uh, published in jbgs have shown that uh, robotic tka has got uh, low pain scores also they have got low pain scores and also have got uh, less usage of uh, opioid analgesia after the surgery similarly in their study patients who have undergone uh, total knee replacement with robotic tk have uh, uh, early straight leg raise test and also um, in the same group patients have uh, better satisfaction uh, and the time to surgery to discharge is quite less compared to uh, conventional tk and uh, this study done by james and their group have looked at uh, comparing the robotic tk versus uh, conventional tk it's a meta analysis and it's a systematic review so they have looked into uh, nearly 2000 uh, robotic tk compared to 4000 conventional total knee replacements definitely in robotic tk they have noticed a superior precision of processes implantation compared to uh, the other group and there's uh, no significant clinical outcome difference in terms of uh, uh clinical outcomes or uh, complication profiles in both the cohorts and in others uh, study done by arthur and their group uh, in 2020 published their results looking into the functional and the quality of life improvement and have they have done a minimum two year follow up in the study so they haven't found any conclusive difference uh in the mid term to long term functional outcomes but definitely uh, patients with the robotic uh, tk have uh, got better outcomes in the early uh, period within one year so looking at the implant survivorship uh, conventional tk has uh, definitely shown excellent uh, long term survivorship but uh, recently robotic tk have got increased popularity because uh, it will execute the plan wherein uh, the tibial varus alignment would not go more than 3 degrees and it is found that uh, small alignment of implants would lead to uh, aseptic loosening and uh, revision uh, total knee replacements so this robotic tk would uh, help to uh, improve the position and may translate into a greater survivorship although uh, robotic tk has improved the limb alignment restoration but still uh, there there are there, there are not many long term studies that have shown any implant on the survivorship or revision rates and complications all the data that uh, supports robotic knee replacements are uh, published um, with the results within 2 years or uh, within 3 years uh, duration so it's always important to look forward for this randomized controlled studies for long term uh, in order to prove the benefit of robotic joint replacements there's two studies uh, have published in 2017 one uh, comparing mako the other one was robodoc uh, they have seen uh, patients who have undergone robotic tk have got uh, almost near 98% of uh, uh, accuracy in terms of predicting the right implant size and also placing the implants uh, intraoperatively in accurate uh, position also have got a better uh, clinical outcomes uh, compared to conventional surgery so looking at the long term survivorship uh, there are only very limited studies that talk about it so in the long term there is no significant difference between robotic tk versus conventional tk in terms of functional outcomes aseptic loosening or overall survivorship so this is the only uh, study that uh, i found uh, looking into the follow up for 10 years but probably the robotic solutions that were included in the study would be a robodoc because uh, mako was introduced in 2016 and all the other robotic platforms have introduced in the last 2 years so uh, probably uh, looking into this newer robotic solutions and their outcomes would um, shed a better idea of uh, uh, outcomes uh, with all this newer uh, alignment strategies so uh, probably this study is little biased in terms of uh, mentioning only robotic robotoc as a robotic solution uh, so probably that could be one of the reasons why they could not find much difference in the outcomes looking into the cost analysis uh, definitely robotic uh, joint replacements have got marked uh, higher costs 
and there's an up, substantial upfront and maintenance expenditure, almost ranging from uh, 400,000 to 1.5 million. In addition, patients have to undergo an advanced imaging. Uh, and they have to use this disposable instrumentation, uh, which also costs uh, more compared to conventional total knee replacements. Also increased operative theta times, and also the learning phase for a surgeon would also add up costs. And also occasionally, or maybe periodically, they need uh, software updates. Uh, for all this robotic solution. So that would also increase the cost for the uh, robotic solutions to adopt for a surgeon. So looking into some of the studies, looking uh, at the costs, a uh, study done by Michael Mont and their group have looked into 30 day, 60 day and 90 day costs. In their study, they have found the robotic TK have got uh, low post-operative costs compared to um, conventional TK. And uh, robotic TK was also associated with uh, lower 90-day readmissions, which would also save some kind of a cost for uh, the overall uh, quality of care for the patient. Another study done by Christina and their group have looked into uh, 519 robotic uh, replacements with a propensity matched uh, cohort of 2000 conventional TKs. Uh, they have seen that uh, overall 90-day episode of costs were less costly in robotic TKs, and they have also seen that patients had fewer readmissions and uh, greater home discharges in robotic TKA group. And this is uh, one of the study that we did uh, in 2019 uh, that I presented in ISTA last year. So we looked into the costs for robotic TK compared to conventional TK. So we found that uh, robotic TK has significantly got lower mean home health costs and home rehab costs. Whereas there are no significant differences were observed in outpatient rehab, total rehab and the length of stay. Also, we haven't found uh, much clinical difference in terms of inpatient costs be between MAKO and the non-MAKO patients. Now talking about the ergonomic health, uh, often surgeons uh, undergo some kind of a musculoskeletal injuries uh, from uncompromised uncom uh, position, postural positions. There's one study that was done by Skoll et al uh, comparing the conventional TK versus uh, robotic TK. Patients who have uh, used a robotic solution have got uh, less uh, shoulder and back problems compared to conventional TK. And also robotic TK further reduces the physical stress on uh, cervical and thoracic spine. Also it provides an eye level robotic software display wherein uh, you can uh, directly visualize the uh, surgery in front of your uh, uh, screen. So that would reduce the stress on uh, uh, the surgeon. Looking at some of the limitations for robotic TK, it needs substantial installation and maintenance costs for robotic device. Also, it needs additional pre-operative imaging. Also, it uh, increases the operative times during the learning phase. And also, it's important to train the surgical team before incorporating the robotic solutions into the theater. Also, it needs further updates and also needs uh, servicing uh, at some point of time uh, down the line. Also, small uh, considerations uh, in, in the surgery, it needs additional incisions uh, in order to place the pins on the trackers. And also this track, uh, these pins could lead to a stress riser and can put patients at risk for periprosthetic fractures. Also, uh, theoretically, it might impose a risk of uh, injuring the neurovascular structures. And um, there are also, intrinsic time delays, uh, which can be avoided, but uh, it needs a bit of more time in order to pre-operative plan and adjust the implants in the operating theater. So also increasing the surgical duration while planning uh, would theoretically also increase the risk of periprosthetic joint infection, which is also a concern. And uh, looking into this active and the semi-active robotic solutions uh, have to be advanced uh, in a to a position wherein it protects all the soft tissue structures around in order to surgeon to confidently allow the robot to perform its bony cuts. To summarize, uh, robotic TK would definitely deliver optimal bone resection and implant positioning and an intraoperative device to execute this plan with the high level of accuracy. 
uh, one more great advantage with this robotic solutions are that they are uh, collecting great volume of data, which can be used for machine learning to predict uh, the best implant sizes and the best implant plans in order to uh, deliver the best clinical outcomes for the patient in future. Also more uh, randomized controlled long-term studies needed uh, with uh, the newer uh, robotic solutions that were introduced in the last few years uh, to understand the real value of uh, these solutions compared to uh, the manual TKA. And also these uh, robotic uh, assisted uh, total knee replacement solutions should be cost effective in order to uh, have more surgeons uh, utilize these technologies to deliver uh, more accurate results. Thank you. Thank you Ravi for that brilliant talk on uh, robotics and joint replacement. A uh, couple of questions from our side. Sure. One is you mentioned there's always a risk of infection, right? Because of the prolonged surgical time setting up. I mean, it's quite a cumbersome process, maybe in the initial times and over a period of time with the experience, it can be reduced. Now you have worked in different centers across the US, you've worked in South Korea, you've worked in Australia. What has been the experience? Do they prior, I mean, do they shift some of these patients to conventional TK where there is a risk of infection, for example, diabetics or who are obese? Uh, so uh, I haven't seen patients being shifted to manual TK uh, in case of uh, diabetics or obese. Um, they would still execute robotic uh, thing. But uh, I think if a patient is obese or if, she, if a patient is of ASA grade two or three, so probably surgeon would choose a kind of a robotic solution that he is more easier to do. Say, for example, if a surgeon has an option of Mako, Rosa, Omnibot, and uh, Navio, uh, being Mako the market leader for quite a while for now and uh, have their software so uh, advanced compared to other robotic solutions, it makes surgeons seamlessly easy to perform uh, robotic surgery uh, for that patient using Mako. Uh, that's what I personally have uh, appreciated that difference when uh, my doing my fellowship. So, so if, 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 a, if a Mako robot uh, is being in that hospital facility for like more than three years and surgeon is performing more than 200 to 300 joints with that robotic platform, he would be much easier to execute the plan in uh, high-risk patients. Thank you very for that. Now, we all know when you talk about computers and when you talk about robots, there's a very popular saying say, uh, that if you put garbage in, you may get garbage out, right? So if your data that you put inside is wrong, you may always get, I mean, it could be an error that's happening. So what are the techniques do you think where the learning curve could be minimized? For example, if you have, I mean, everyone gets trained with a conventional TK, you think then moving to navigation and only then afterwards moving to robotics would be a better idea to reduce the problems of the learning curve. What has been your experience? Of course, you've, as I said earlier, you've worked at different centers. So how do you think the learning curve could be reduced? So uh, firstly, uh, that's a brilliant question, uh, Dr. Gopal, and I would uh, uh, definitely uh, take that point as garbage in garbage out is a very important thing. And I think three important considerations to understand this. First, any surgeon who wants to uh, use a robotic solution should, should first should completely understand uh, how that robotic solution works. If, a, if, a, if it's a Mako, um, it has an added advantage that uh, it has a pre-operative CT uh, that is taken and that CT is help, uh, it will be helping to create a kind of a 3D model. So when you intraoperatively open the plan, most likely uh, the preoperative plan that you have is more accurate because it mostly correlates with the CT data. But with, whereas with uh, solutions that are imageless, it's definitely you have to put in the right anatomical uh, landmarks into the computer. If you don't put in, it will definitely throw out wrong plans. And it happened a couple of times, uh, personally for myself, even during the surgery, you rotate the co femoral component to three degree external rotation in order to have the flexion space balanced. And then uh, after executing the plan, 
your uh, flexion state, uh, space, space is still tight. You, are, you don't know why. And then when you look back and see, then the data points that you have entered in is wrong. So you while you catch the epicondylar axis by medial epicondyle, lateral epicondyle, for some reason, if you don't register it properly, then you are going to uh, create a kind of a plan which you have chosen in the wrong anatomical landmarks. So that's why it's very important to understand uh, the robotic solution well, and then correctly choose the right anatomical landmarks and should be prepared even if you went wrong in you know, how to get away with it. Also, with the, there's one more uh, problem that I have, uh, I mean, I have uh, seen a couple of times with Mako as well is that uh, Mako has two types of representations uh, for uh, transepicondylar axis. So quite often it shows transepicondylar axis as zero, but if you show if it shows as posterior condylar axis, it shows plus three. So if if you are not sure if if you are not aware of much aware of the surgical system, you just see the posterior condylar axis and see three, and you take in your mind yourself that it's transepicondylar axis, which is like plus three. But in a way, you're not externally rotating it. You are just putting it as zero. So that doesn't lead to much problem. It leads to problem when you think it is zero and then you further want to accept some kind of internal rotation like one or two. It is going more into internal rotation rather uh, than neutral. So those kind of things are very, very important uh, for a surgeon to understand the robotic system well, choose the right landmarks, and even if he gets into a problem, he should be able to get out of it with a kind of a solution uh, to balance the knee. So there are all uh, definitely, yeah. definitely they, these are all pertinent problems, which I think everyday surgeons would encounter. And as you mentioned, it's very important to put in the right plans into the computer in order to have the best plans out. But I have seen one uh, uh, advantage with Omnibot wherein you have a pre-op CT done and then you put in the plan and it has an option to call called auto balance. So it can automatically balance the knee and gives the best implant position to balance, uh, the, do, do the cuts. So probably down the line, I think, because since this will be a problem, once all these uh, robotic solutions have data of millions of patients, and then uh, probably it will suggest us what is the best way to do it. And then I think the uh, error or the kind of mistake would go down uh, over the period of time in the coming years. So Ravi, in that case, it is better to go with an image-based robotic system and then move to an imageless uh, system, right? So then your feedback, tactile feedback, you can confirm with your image as well, isn't it? Exactly. So what people do, I have what also I have seen is that with Mako, usually they don't use any kind of a ortho sensors uh, after balancing the knee. There's a product uh, from VeraSense wherein we put that uh, uh, tibial insert to see what the what are the pressures in both medial and lateral side of the joint. So with Mako, most of the time it's accurate. Once the knee is uh, done by Mako, if you put in the VeraSense or the ortho sensor into it, most likely the pressures are equal, most most like to normal. But with other robotic solutions, as the surgeon takes the landmarks intraoperatively and then there, there could be a chance of error. Sometimes postoperatively, the knee is not balanced or the pressures are unequal because that's due to uh, the wrong implant positioning, which is not grossly wrong, but it gives out a wrong kind of a balance because you registered the uh, bony landmarks wrong. So usually you uh, add a Vera sense with this kind of imageless systems in order to just cross check whether you have balanced it right or wrong. And if required, then surgeons would further go and release uh, collaterals or PCL or capsule in order to balance the knee. Thank you, Ravi, for that. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for the fantastic lecture. And I'm sure this talk is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you yeah, so much for joining you, in, Ravi. Thank you so much. Thanks for giving the opportunity and we'll be looking forward to uh, present more talks in the orthopedic principles. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.